Hey guys, welcome to the management of musculoskeletal injuries of strength sports. I'm Thomas Kaufman. I'm a chiropractor, I'm a strength and conditioning coach, and I also coach CrossFit every once in a while. Um, now it is a beautiful day here in Missouri. So I'm going to try and I really want to thank you all for spending the next hour, hour and a half here learning about how to manage injuries with strength athletes. So without further ado, let's just get started. Now, a little bit about me. I have my bachelor's degree for in exercise and movement science. I obtained this at Missouri State University back in 2013. I graduated from Logan University in 2018 with my doctorate degree in chiropractic. I have been in practice for about three years now. Uh, I run Elite Spine Plus here in St. Charles, Missouri. And what we do at Elite Spine Plus is a strength-based approach to health and rehabilitation. Uh, we really utilize a lot of barbell movements, a lot of exercises in order to get people moving, in order to, to, for them to get out of pain and in, to improve their function. Now, recently I started Smart Care Seminars, uh, which is our host today. Uh, this is a pain management and rehabilitation seminar and education uh, program. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to improve the pain management and improve rehabilitation techniques through barbell training or exercise movements. Now, one of my other seminars is a dry needling certification uh, that we're going to be hosting a couple of times throughout the year. Uh, St. Louis and Kansas City are coming up at the beginning of the spring. If you're interested, uh, please send me an email. And one of our other certifications that it's going to be launching in April is going to be the Barbell Performance Institute certification. Um, that's where we are going to be discussing topics like this in deeper and in much more in depth. So keep an eye out for our future certifications. Now, it's important that I give credit where credit is due. Um, I want to really thank everybody in the past of in my life that has allowed me to learn from them. Uh, first of all is uh, Dr. Scott Richmond. He was my professor of strength and conditioning at Missouri State. He really opened up my eyes into what barbell training was and what strength and conditioning could be. After I graduated from Missouri State, I went and started working with a very good powerlifting coach, Matt Reynolds at Strong Gym down in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, that's where I learned a lot of my powerlifting coaching and programming uh, following the starting strength method. Uh, shortly after that, I decided to move on a little bit forward and started looking into weightlifting. It wasn't until I was at Logan University that I decided to obtain my USAW. As you guys can see, I'm no longer registered in the Weightlifting Federation, so I can no longer in good conscience use the title of United States of America Weightlifting Coach. Uh, but I have that certification. I was certified as a level one instructor, so a lot of that, uh, I did a lot of weightlifting for the last two years in my time at Logan. Now, going into the rehabilitation uh, part of my education, um, I want to say that a lot of it came down to, uh, from Charlie Wingroft. He's a physical therapist in Canada. Uh, he actually, I came across his DVDs in the library at Logan University back when I was a student. Uh, they're called Training Equals Rehabilitation and Rehabilitation Equals Training. And he talked a lot about joint centration, the joint by joint model as well as introduction to dynamic neuromuscular uh, stability or systems. Now DNS, as you guys are familiar with it, it's a little bit more, or some of you are familiar with it, it's a little bit more into the de developmental kinesiology. So a lot more in how to move and how to rehabilitate certain movement patterns, right? I learned a lot of that from uh, Robert Lardner, he's a phys physio, I think. He's a physio or PT in the UK and the United States. And I also learned a lot from Richard Ulm himself. Uh, he's a chiropractor in Ohio. And actually, my first DNS course was a DNS weightlifting course with Dr. Ulm uh, down here in Troy, Missouri. Part of it, I also learned, or a lot of my, uh, well, I don't want to say a lot of my, um, rehabilitation exercises are McKenzie based, but the directional preference that I learned from McKenzie, it's part of how I treat a little bit more 
into the pain management scenario of things. And then finally, as of May, uh, that is my joint by joint approach. I would not be fair to say that I'm an SFMA practitioner. It wouldn't be fair for Mr. Uh, Dr. Cook to say that. Uh, that's because I do a small differences. There's a few differences in the SFMA that I that I do in, with my patients. And finally, you know, a lot of the information that I that I have obtained throughout the years comes from uh, different journals: the Journal of Strength and Conditioning, uh, NSCA publications the Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation Journals and PubMed, and honestly, quite a little bit of YouTube. So, we'll see, right? So, um, today we're here to see what are strength sports, right? Uh, how to manage injuries within the strength sport world. And honestly, the first thing that we got to answer is what are strength sports? Well, strength sports are any systems of physical conditioning where muscles are exercised by being worked against a resistance. Uh, in this case, it's going to be the resistance of weights. Now, there are five types of strength sports, bodybuilding, weightlifting, powerlifting, strongman, and functional fitness. Now, this last one, as of 2008, is pretty much known as CrossFit. So mostly all the individuals that end up doing some functional fitness, they end up belonging to a CrossFit gym or box. Now, bodybuilding, well, we look at bodybuilding as physique development, right? This is the hypertrophy aspect of aesthetics, increasing muscles, uh, specifically based on exercise and diet. Now, a lot of bodybuilders end up having some injuries based on repetitive movements, so overuse. And there are a couple of different research articles out there that look into the injuries in bodybuilding. Now, most of these injuries come from large volume of exercises, uh, moderate to heavy load throughout those repetitions, and different ranges of motion. If you have worked with any bodybuilders or have looked at working with any bodybuilders, then you have seen that uh, they will utilize certain ranges of motion, whether it might be reduced range of motion, or they will really emphasize range of motion going a little bit into hypermobility or hyper range of motion. Now, some of the most common injuries in bodybuilding, they do exist. Um, they are pretty much everywhere throughout the body, specifically throughout the spine, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine with the highest numbers. Shoulder is one of the highest uh, areas of injuries that I actually treat in the office. Elbows following a little bit more and then knees. So we can see that uh, injuries in within the bodybuilding world are pretty high. Right now, these injuries don't necessarily mean that there's a trauma. That just means mostly they're overuse or repetitive injuries, uh, very easy to use. We'll talk a little bit more about where most of these kind of come from. Now, weightlifting, the next sport is mostly the Olympic weightlifting. Uh, this is the clean and jerk, and as well as the snatch. So these are explosive and powerful movements with the goal to take very heavy loads overhead as fast as possible. So we start seeing that. A lot of these individuals need flexibility, need mobility. So most of the injuries tend to come back or, or tend to happen within areas that require a lot of mobility and stability. Uh, when we look at the incidence per hour, there's about three, three injuries per 1,000 hours of training. Um, most of the weightlifters that I have worked with, they do come in with low back and shoulder issues. Very few of them have come in with knee or neck injuries. But as you guys can see, low back, again, it's a very large uh, part of a lot of these sports, right? So they're going to be bending forward. They're going to be creating flexion and extension of the low back. Shoulders, uh, very repetitive movements, heavy loads. If you guys have seen this, uh, the clean and jerks, well, uh, those are very heavy movements around the shoulder joint. Not only that, sometimes they end up going behind their head and you have shoulder or elbow injuries which i was a little surprised that elbows were not uh were not much higher than neck um actually you know calhoun and fry uh, that's where i got the all this information now powerlifting uh powerlifting these movements um the main goal of the powerlifting movement is to lift the heaviest amount of weight as efficiently as possible normally this happens by altering the distance the bar is going to be displaced so in this case, this individual right here, he's doing a conventional deadlift. Uh, you guys have seen, or you guys, 
if you guys do a quick Google search or YouTube search, you guys will see the other difference, which is the sumo deadlift. Um, in very, very high levels of powerlifting or competitive powerlifting, you will see that a lot of individuals end up utilizing a sumo deadlift situation in order to maximize their strength by being able to lift the heaviest amount of weight that's little as possible. Now, there are big three movements within the powerlifting world. Uh, those are going to be your bench, your squat, and your deadlift. If you guys are not familiar with those, uh, I would recommend to get a little bit more acquainted with them because it's mostly those main three exercises are going to be the staple of any exercise routine in any of these strength sports. Now, some of the most common injuries in powerlifting um, happen uh, on athletes that have been training between six and eight hours a week. Uh, if you are one of those individuals or if you've been working with some of those individuals, you know that their training is actually pretty, uh, it's pretty consistent and they do like their rest. So this six to eight hours, you guys are going to see that they are heavy loads for very little repetitions, right? So a lot of these six to eight hours are going to be displaced between three to four days of about two to four, two to, uh, between two hours of each training session. Now, a lot of these injuries for power lifters came from overuse injuries. Uh, those were about 34%. Uh, what Kug et al. Uh, mentions in the research is that a lot of the other ones were simple uh, twists, sprains, and um, non-athletic injuries. Now, there is a lot of acute pain or acute injuries within the powerlifting world. Uh, most of them come from the shoulder, low back, and knee. Now, if you guys put them together, yes, a lot of the injuries that come through the shoulder are mainly because of the bench and how most powerlifters end up benching. Low back, actually, it was, um, it was uh, described as secondary to a squat. So it wasn't even the deadlift that actually created most of these injuries. Uh, actually, for most of the knee injuries, it was the deadlift and the squat together. So um, just because somebody presents with the low back into your clinic, that doesn't mean that you can narrow it down to say, oh, it was a deadlift or, oh, it was your squat. So make sure that you guys are assessing your patients adequately whenever you're just looking and working with some of these individuals. Now, strongmans. Uh, strongmans, there's not many of them out there within the uh, local community. Actually, here in St. Charles or Missouri, there is a large population of strongmans individuals. Now, these, uh, for the longest time, they've been exhibitors of strength. If you guys have seen uh, some of the strongman competitions, they normally carry odd objects or are starting to lift very, very, very heavy odd objects as well, right? Uh, they do heavy loads, high volume. It's basically heavy load, high volume, high intensity training. Um, very fast paced, a lot of conditioning, a lot of muscle that has to be carried. So a lot of the injuries here tend to follow a little bit more the same line of um, injury pattern as your powerlifting and a little bit of your weightlifting. You'll have your lower back injuries, which are going to be mostly most common on all of them. Uh, shoulders are pretty common, right? So you have a lot of overhead pressing. You also have bench pressing. You have carries with your arms and shoulders, such as like the last picture that we just saw. Some biceps uh, and knee injuries, they both kind of go hand in hand, mostly because of the, um, the per repetitiveness and the heavy loads that some of these areas are undergoing, right? So the biceps, most, most of these injuries in the bicep occur after heavy deadlifts. And you guys might have seen some of those um, in YouTube or some crazy injury video on YouTube or, or Facebook or Instagram. Uh, following some of those injuries, muscle strains, tendon pains, and are part of the acute injury. So they're, do, they do happen quite often. Now, again, these individuals, they're very strong individuals. That doesn't mean they, they're, they, they are not going to get into some difficult situations where there's going to happen some muscle strain or they're going to end up injuring themselves with some tendon tendon pain right so keep in mind that a lot of this is going to be heavy load probably underslept under eaten um, and at a fast pace scenario now none of these have been looked into a competitive style most of them have been actually 
looked post-competition and post-training. So a lot of the injuries that we have seen so far uh, don't necessarily equate to the injuries that we may see from uh, day-to-day individuals that are trying to hit the gym. Now, functional fitness is probably the latest craze. Uh, I say latest because it's still quite new. It, you know, CrossFit started back in 2008 and it's just taken the strength world uh, by storm. It's actually one of the, I, I want to say it's one of the best sports for strength, for the strength sport arena. Uh, functional fitness or CrossFit is always going to be looking a little bit more into the broad spectrum of training. So they take into consideration strongman training, gymnastic training, plyometrics, high intensity interval training, powerlifting, and much more. You know, there's weightlifters out there that are also starting to do CrossFit. Actually, a lot of the new weightlifters began doing CrossFit, ended up enjoying weightlifting much more, and made the transition, which it's pretty neat, right? Now, if you've attended a CrossFit class, you know there's a lot of repetition, you know there's a lot of intensity, you know that there is a lot of volume. But some of the most uh, common injuries in CrossFit happen to be shoulder, knee, and low back, right? Uh, it's not very common to just see three areas of injury, but it does make sense. A lot of the movements that they're doing, they're repetitive movements throughout these ranges of motion. Low back, you're loading the squat, you're loading the deadlift. So a lot of repetitive movement, a lot of repetitive stress throughout the low back. Shoulders, you got push-ups, uh, ring muscle-ups, you got overhead presses, you got bar, uh, you got barbell and barbell pull-downs, uh, you got uh, pull-ups. So not only that, not only are they just pull-ups, they're also kipping pull-ups, right? So there's a lot of stress going on throughout the shoulder. And finally, you got your knees. Now most of the knees uh, came down from repetitive loading through jumping. So a lot of individuals don't necessarily know how to land a jump, uh, and that is a very common thing. Most people know how to jump, but they don't know how to land. Now, overall, we're looking at a little bit of different injuries, but in the shoulder, we start to see tendonitis, mostly around the bicipital tendon. So bicipital tendonitis, a little bit of anterior and middle delt tendonitis. We also see some muscle strains. A lot of this muscle strain kind of uh, happens to be around the uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles, especially with external rotation or even some shoulder pressing or overhead pressing. Um, now, a lot of individuals still call it impingement syndrome. I still call it impingement syndrome. Um, we know there's no impingement, but until we have a better term, we're just gonna continue calling it that, right? Uh, it's just easy. People know what we're talking about. There's something going on with the shoulder and it needs to be addressed. In the elbow, now I know that we didn't cover much elbow, in the last couple of slides, but there is some tendonitis, especially when it comes to weightlifting. Uh, weightlifting, especially in novice individuals, they tend to not be able to get into that front rack position. And what they do is they come in, overload it a little bit, not a little bit, but a lot, and end up developing some sort of tendonitis, mostly within the extensor and flexors, muscles of the forearm, uh, most of the bicipital or tricep tendonitis, you guys will find on individuals that do a lot of deadlifting. So uh, power lifters, crossfitters, and even uh, bodybuilders are going to develop bicipital or tricep tendonitis. Uh, tricep tendonitis is mostly left for those individuals who do a lot of heavy bench presses. That is because they're mostly utilizing the tricep in order to move most of the weight. Uh, they use a lot of the shoulder musculature in order to stabilize that movement, such as your scapula as well and then they normally only utilize the muscles of the pectoral region to finish the move. A lot of the back injuries, which is mostly uh, referred to mid to low back, are mostly muscle strains, some ligament sprains, and very few herniations. Actually, um, there was not a lot of research out there uh, when it came to herniations due to any of these strength sports. So most of the herniations that you may be able to see in practice are going to be coming from individuals who spend a lot of time um, in non-athletic settings and start partaking in athletic participation uh, one to two hours a day for two to three days a week. Um, those are these individuals who are untrained, they don't have the capacity and will end up getting hurt later on because of some fault.
Uh, finally, we got some knees. Now in the knees, one of the big ones was muscle strain, mostly the quadricep, ten, uh, quadricep muscle. So that leads into tendon pain, which can be patellar tendon. So a lot of times it's classified as patellar tendonitis. I like to call it patellofemoral pain, uh, mostly because it tends to be right behind the patella on top of the, fibula, uh, on top of the femur, right? So that patellofemoral pain is very common with soccer players, jumpers, runners, and especially right now within the CrossFit worlds, a lot of individuals don't necessarily know how to run and they are partaking in this long, hard, uh, strenuous workouts that involve running, jumping, squatting, and they just never work in that technique of running. And finally, ACL, PCL, MCL, or ACL tears. Now, for most of these ligaments within the knee joint, you're looking at uh, activities where you reach failure, right? So most of the ACL or PCL injuries come from weightlifting and powerlifting, uh, where individuals blow out their knees by performing a squat or dropping too fast um, on a power clean or snatch, and they end up injuring themselves. Uh, very few times have we seen uh, MCL or LCL tears within the strongman population, but they do happen uh, specifically when they're doing heavy carries, such as a yoke carry or the grocery carry that you guys saw on a couple of slides back. Now, so we now know all of these injuries are about to happen and they're going to be happening within that population. So what can we do to help this population? Well, as you guys make your journey through life, university, and stuff like that, or you continue creating a little bit more opportunities for yourself to learn. One of the big things that, that you can do is one, if you're a trainer, you can you can refer them out to uh, the healthcare provider that is going to help them the most, right? So this is where the general physical examination is gonna come into play. If you are a healthcare provider or you're studying for, to become a healthcare provider, uh, part of your physical examination and history has to come or has to cover uh, what movement limitations are they having? Uh, have, have there been any changes in function since the injury? Any swelling, any pain? What movement increases the pain? What relieves the pain? You know, if there is any load, sometimes uh, most of these, specifically most of these athletes will end up having pain with specific loads, uh, mostly when, when they're reaching that 60, 75% of their one rep max. So sometimes, if they are working with loads between 20 and 60%, they, they'll say they feel better. They feel good, the pain is not there, and they actually feel like they can get a good workout. And you know, always try to figure out whether this is an acute injury or a chronic injury, right? So acute versus chronic pain is also going to play a big key on how we're going to be treating this patient and who should we be making this referral to. Now, part of your general physical examination, if you are a um, a healthcare provider is going to be doing your neurological examination, such as dermatomes, myotomes, whether they are have full strength, um, whether they don't have full strength based on an injury, or whether they don't have full strength based on a neurological issue. A motor, are they able to perform certain functions, certain movements? Can they maintain the position? Uh, I normally tend to uh, look at this through active ranges of motion, resistive ranges of motion, and passive ranges of motion. If you're in the healthcare uh, faci uh, arena or area, you're going to look at orthopedics. You're gonna do your orthopedic examinations. Uh, if you're a trainer, you're not allowed to touch your your, your clients or your, pay or your members, so please refrain from doing any orthopedic examinations that you might find yourself on YouTube or Instagram. Now, and then this leads us to special tests. Uh, for a lot of special tests, we will look at a little bit into what systems are out there uh, that may guide our differential or our diagnosis. Now, when we look at ranges of motion, you wanna look at the limitations between active, passive, and resisted. Uh, all of them are going to give you some information on what is really going on whether it's a joint problem, a muscle problem, or an actual movement problem. Now, some individuals may present differently where they have pain with active ranges of motion versus passive ranges of motion and versus resistant ranges of motion. So this will give the healthcare provider a little bit more information on what may be going on, such as, is this a tear? Is this a strain? Is this a sprain? 
Is this just general achiness because this individual just overdid it yesterday and today is feeling a little bit more sore? So that will give us a little bit more information and I believe ranges of motion are going to give you a lot more information than any special tests. So now moving on to the special examination. Now there is a lot of different exams. There are a lot of different systems out there. We've already talked about SFMA, there's FMS, there's DNS, there's your QBA, and you know if you're a healthcare provider, you can even do imaging. Now all of these are great. They are amazing at what they do. SFMA is great for just general global movements. FMS is great to predict. Uh, well, it's not even great to predict. It's just a good tool to have to see how your how your patients are moving, especially if you're a trainer. Uh, a lot of trainers that I know use the FMS to have a baseline of how their athletes are moving. Now, DNS, uh, DNS has a clinical route and a, a trainer's route. So if you guys are interested in dynamic neuromuscular stabilization, uh, go ahead and you know dive deep into that stuff. It's really cool. I would always encourage everybody to take the first course first and then make the decision based off of that. Um, <clears throat> QBA is a qualitative biomechanical analysis. I've been doing qualitative biomechanical analysis for about nine years now. So a lot of what I do, I learned it through QBA and it just so happens that it fits well with my SFMA and my DNS testing. Uh, when it comes to imaging, you really have to ask the patient whether or, or this goes in, in hand with what you are um, thinking about, right? If you're a healthcare professional, you're going to be thinking whether you're going to be taking an x-ray or an MRI. Now, in my opinion, and uh, I know a lot of other healthcare professionals have said this, um, mostly because I've been in, in the room with them, uh, the best special examination is the activity itself. And I tend to agree with them a whole lot, right? Uh, if somebody comes in telling you that they hurt when they squat, doesn't help if you just do active range of motion of the hip, passive range of motion of the hip, and resisted range of motion. Uh, take them through the full squat. See what they're doing. See what their limitations are. See where they're com compensating, where they're shifting. Now, SFMA does a lot of that uh, just based on active range of motions and global movement, but sometimes people squat differently, right? So in my head, it doesn't make sense to take everybody through the SFMA squat when I know based on their uh, specific demands, whether it's a power lifter or a weight lifter, that they may not be able to complete the test like I want them to, or like SFMA wants them to, right? Same thing with bracing or breathing. Uh, some people might brace a little different than what DNS wants them to, or FMS, you know, some people might lunge a little different versus what FMS really says that people should be lunging like. So again, it goes back to we're treating the individual, we're not treating the system, we use those systems to guide our, our treatment plan uh, or our programming if you are a trainer. Now, it's important to understand all of these healing times, right? So once we figure out whether it's a joint, a muscle, or a tendon, then we do our examination or special testing, and then we finally start looking at, okay, what is really going on? Is this just general soreness based on exercise? Did he go too far, too fast, or did he go too heavy too soon? Um, and now he is in some discomfort. Uh, if that's the case, you know, you're know you working with delayed onset muscle soreness, so just give it a couple of days, uh, maybe give him a, a little bit of an idea of what to start doing, um, try some ice, heat, you know, those kind of stuff, make them move a little bit more so that a lot of that sensation kind of goes away. Now, if we are actually working or our diagnosis has a little bit of like muscle strain, ligament sprain, or tendon injuries, or even bone injuries, which um, most of them would be referred out, uh, then we start looking at different times of healing rates, right? So muscle strains, you're going to have your muscle strains and ligament sprains, you're going to have different grades. So grade one to three, they may take between a couple of days to a couple of months, right? If it's a ligament, it might take a couple of days to a year or so. And for most of the time, if it's a grade three and we're looking at longer than three weeks of recovery, we're looking at post-surgical rehabilitation at that point. And that is going to look a little different than if we were just treating a grade one or a grade two uh, muscle muscle ligament sprain strain, right? Uh, again, you know, this is always going to be into consideration with your history taking. So make sure that you do a diligent job. Now, history taking is not just for the healthcare professional. 
a lot of the trainers can do a good job about taking a history and sometimes your patients might be a little more honest to the personal trainer because they're actually trying to make life changes. Uh, they will go to the healthcare professional because they are in pain, not necessarily because they want to make healthier life changes. That's why they got the personal trainer. So if you are a personal trainer and are able to start working with a physical therapist, chiropractor, or even an MD uh, to hone in your skills or get a little bit better at providing better services to your clientele, go for it. If you are a chiropractor, uh, you can, or physical therapist, or even a medical doctor, you're able to reach out to some of this community and see what they're doing and what they can do better in order to work together, right? Uh, after all, the, the whole goal or purpose of musculoskeletal medicine is to improve pain management for most of it, most individuals, as well as increase a lot of their function. Now, we also have a little bit of articular cartilage repair, ligament grafts. Uh, those are all post-surgical um, rehabilitation scenarios. But at the same time, there is a lot that we can do within exercise medicine or exercise as medicine. Uh, and we'll cover a little bit more through the next couple of slides. Now, there are a couple of considerations between some tissues. So we're gonna start with muscle considerations. Uh, now, these are going to be easy to rehab. For the most part, they're rich in blood supply. They do heal a little bit faster, or at least faster than tendons and ligaments. Um, an injury to them, yes, they can create some imbalances and compensations. This is why it's important to be able to have a baseline on your patient. So if you are a new trainer, make sure that you do a very diligent uh, examination, whether that may be your onboarding, take circumferential uh, markers from biceps, thighs, etc. Just so you know what's kind of happening if all of a sudden your athlete or, in, or a member comes in with some muscle loss, you should be aware of that and should be able to refer out to the right practitioner. Um, when it comes to muscle rehabilitation, a lot of mechanical stimulation actually has been proven to improve healing and improve function. So we'll start seeing that a lot of mechanical stimulation actually encourages a lot of proper healing, a lot of good healing in a lot of different tissues, not just muscles. Now, tendons, they do have more of a limited blood supply. We all know that tendons tend to heal at a very, very slow rate. Uh, this is why a lot of power lifters end up tearing a hamstring tendon while they're benching. Uh, not because they are weak, but because their muscle recover a lot faster than their tendons. Uh, and for the most part, this is a surgical uh, procedure to recover that tendon, and then you are able to start doing some of your rehabilitation in your office or in your clinic. Now, a lot of uh, activities that are good for any kind of tendon pain, uh, if it's not torn, uh, eccentrics and isometric load have really shown a lot of improvement for people with Achilles tendon uh, pain. Uh, there is no tendinosis or tendonitis that I know of um, to describe them. It just, a lot of the research out there says Achilles tendon pain is, has been shown to be improved uh, with eccentric or isometric loads. Now. If you know that it's a tendon, a lot of that has to, a lot of rehabilitation is going to come from gradual increase in tendon stress, right? So if we already know that they are bodybuilders, then we're not going to have them be jumping and absorbing a lot of forces with those tendons. We're gonna create a little bit of a better adaptation when we're looking to do gradual increase in strength or load. That's so again, uh, a lot of tendons respond to mechanical stimulation and that is why at the office, where I work, uh, we utilize a lot of barbell movements, a lot of heavy loading uh, to create that mechanical stimulation. Now, mechanical stimulation can be a simple and an effective approach to enhance muscle and connective tissue regeneration. It has been proven uh, to aid in muscle regeneration when there has been actually lacerations and reduce some tissue scarring. Now, mechanical tissue comes in a lot of different ways. It's stretch activation, vibration plates, just like it's shown here. Uh, mechanical conditioning, which can be done with um, electrical stimulation, can be done with vibration plates here and isometric holds, uh, can be done with um, different just general movement exercises. Now, massage and instrument systems of tissue manipulation also stimulate a lot of the mechanical receptors within the tissue, so they do help a lot with connective tissue regeneration and some 
And to some extent, they also help with muscle regeneration. Now, physical manipulation, we're not talking about adjusting these individuals per se, but we're looking at load management. So at this point, it's how can we increase the uh, stimulation of these tissues if the individual is only able to perform up to a certain degree of uh, movement. So this is where barbell training, dumbbell, kettlebell training, or even just regular bands might be able to increase the mechanical stimulation that you're able to apply to these individuals. So keeping that in mind, ligaments definitely heal the, the slowest uh, for the most part. If you have a torn ligament, you can still continue to move. Uh, there's a lot of new evidence out there that doesn't necessarily favor surgical repair of ligaments, specifically your ACL or even uh, your anterior telefibular ligament, which is mostly torn after you sprain your ankle a few times. So all research says uh, that your treatment is always going to be uh, dependent on the grade of your injury. New research says that a lot of conservative care, including general range of motion, uh, load management, and proper uh, strength and conditioning of these areas or these uh, injury sites can be just as beneficial or actually even more beneficial in the long run for individuals that have uh, torn ligaments. So, you know, there is a, there's a lot of things that within the last five years are starting to change within musculoskeletal medicine. And I think it's important to stay up to date with a lot of that information, mostly because, you know, within five to 10 years, if you guys are about to graduate or are going to be graduating, you guys will be dealing with a lot of these changes. And a lot of the idea um, behind a lot of these changes is providing better conservative care to athletes, uh, blue collar people, business persons, et cetera. So once we figure out where the injury kind of comes from, whether it's muscle, tendon, or ligament, uh, there are a couple of steps that we can take to build a proper conservative care, right? So in my office, uh, the following is what we do. Uh, if you guys want to follow along with what I do and put it in practice later on in your, in, in your careers, uh, more than happy to share that with you later on. So right now we're just gonna kind of run through some of this stuff, uh, some of the principles that I look into. So I created this um, conservative management pyramid. Uh, this is basically what I utilize in order to treat uh, most of my patients. So at the base, we have pain management. Uh, now, not because I want to chase pain, but most of your patients are gonna come to you because they are in pain, not because they want to progress or you know, have you do symptom modification exercises or look at their load management. Uh, they're gonna come to you because they're in pain and they want to get out of pain. So we are going to be looking at pain management and what does that look like? What can we do in order to reduce somebody's sensations or change somebody's perception about their pain? Once that's kind of taken care of and that also includes a lot of education for the patient, then we move into load management. Uh, what can they uh, what are they capable of doing? What are they not capable of doing? Once we figure that out, then we move into symptom modification, which, you know, most people don't want to do symptom modification because they think it's cheating. I think symptom modification exercises actually encourage individuals to stay active and move through their pain and disabilities uh, better than no symptom modification and just taking them straight into a progression or regression treatment plan. So let's dive a little bit deeper into a lot of this stuff. So pain management. Um, pain management has two phases, a passive phase and an active phase. So in my case, I call them passive and active modalities. Now in, in your career and in life, you will come across many, many different passive modalities. Instrument assisted soft tissue, cupping, dry needling, acupuncture, cold laser, ultrasound, braces, taping, uh, casts, et cetera. So a lot of that is very helpful, right? And a lot, of, a lot of them don't necessarily work the same way that we have thought that they worked. And so that doesn't mean that they don't work or they're not going to create a short-term effect so that your patients can then start doing certain exercises. Um, a lot of the passive modalities that we use at the office is instrument-assisted soft tissue and dry needling. Uh, dry needling is probably, again, not to pitch it in, but it's one of the techniques that I use the most in order to provide better relief to my patients. I've seen a lot of neurological changes within uh, perception of certain areas in my patients. 
and that has allowed me to progress them a little bit faster uh, through some of their exercises. Now, a lot of active modalities that help with pain management is diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, I do take this from dynamic neuromuscular stabilization, a lot of their cues in order to um, create proper diaphragmatic breathing or intra-abdominal pressure are very useful in order to uh, decrease a lot of the pain sensation, especially when it comes to pain around the low back or hip region. Um, I can see exercises. Uh, I will probably say that I use this about 90% of the time when individuals come in with a hot low back. Uh, these are mostly preferential uh, movements or positions. So I have used some flexion exercises and I have used some extension exercises as well. And then uh, postural accommodations and ergonomics. Now, if you guys have had me in a couple of classes uh, at Logan University, you guys know that I'm not a big fan of really talking about posture or the perfect posture because I agree that everybody's posture should be different and it's going to be different. So maybe sometimes you just need a little bit of postural accommodations, right? Uh, maybe sometimes you need a little bit more extension through the thoracic spine or you just need to roll your shoulders back slightly more. Um, but uh, I do believe in uh, changing ergonomics. Now, ergonomics do play a big role in patients' pain perception and pain disability because they actually uh, are able to feel that pain when they do certain uh, certain activities. Uh, most of the ergonomics are going to be based around the office. So neck pain is mostly linked with people that have um, a very low monitor on their on their desk or are looking down a lot uh, towards that monitor. They're straining their eyes. They normally jut their chin a little bit more. Um, that does kind of tend to be to play a big role within ergonomics. Now, uh, moving on to load management, once we figure out what the pain management techniques we're gonna be using, then we can start looking at load management. Uh, what are we talking about load management? Where well, we're looking at reducing the stressors. Uh, this doesn't just involve physical stressors, this also means mental and physiological stressors. So we may actually be changing some of the things of, of how they may be perceiving certain situations. Uh, this is where it's important to have a good relationship with a uh, licensed um, therapist. This is where you can send them, send your patients out and make sure that they get the help they need. Uh, we are not trained psychologists or therapists. So sometimes what we say to our patients may not be the best thing that they need to hear. Uh, physiologically, uh, this comes a little bit more into the nutrition aspect of things. Sometimes, um, and I am, I am at fault too. I, I eat an inflammatory diet, right? I don't necessarily eat very healthy. And it's funny because I just posted a meme on Instagram about dieting and eating healthy. Um, so a lot of that uh, physiological response is going to be coming from the stressors surrounding physical, mental health and nutritional habits. So if we can change a little bit of nutritional habits just by having them drink a little bit more water, reducing their coffee intake, uh, decreasing some of those stim stimulants that they're, that they're uh, taking probably before they're working out. Uh, there, it's going to facilitate some improvements and it's going to preserve a little bit more of that musculoskeletal health, right? Now, there are three types of load management that can be physical. Uh, this is the duration of the workout, the velocity of the movements, and the weight of the movements, so, or the weight of the exercise, right? So if you are running long distances, right? So that duration is probably going to be 30 minutes, 40 minutes. If you have a runner, then, you know, you might want to tell them, it's like, hey, I want you to run for 20 minutes and stop, decrease that duration, right? Decrease the velocity of a movement. So maybe don't try to go as fast when you're doing metabolic conditioning and CrossFit. Uh, take your time, work on your form, work on these um, different strategies in order to be able to uh, feel better, right? And then weight, probably, you know, nobody wants to hear it, especially power lifters, weight lifters, or any strength athlete, uh, reduce your weight. That is one of the hardest things that you'll ever ask them to do. But like I mentioned earlier, sometimes they will have pain with heavy loads and not moderate to light loads. So it's important to be able to introduce them to this concept of, hey, you know what? You're still going to be training. You may not be training with heavy, heavy loads, but you're going to be still utilizing that neuromuscular motor control and you are going to get better 
a lot of times overuse injuries tend to get better by decreasing weight and velocity of the movement. So after we figure out what load management techniques we're gonna use, then we can start doing some symptom identification, right? Uh, this is where we start looking at the qualitative biomechanical analysis, the movement quality. What are the movement standards that they're trying to pursue, uh, pursue and what movement planes are they moving through? Uh, the squat on a weightlifting platform versus a squat on a powerlifting platform are going to look very different. So this is where we are looking at how can we modify these two different squats and still be able to give them the effect that they need. Can we build their endurance? Can we continuously increase their power by changing some of these exercises, by increasing, it, by uh, reducing the load or reducing the velocity and still be able to create some intensity, right? Now, finally, we get to the progression and regression. So once we have our um, symptom modification exercises and your patient is going through them and he is seeing some results, then we can start introducing more motor patterns. So what is the easiest pattern to introduce? Well, that's going to be dependent on whether it's an acute injury, it's gonna be dependent on whether it's a chronic injury or if you have a post-surgical individual. Uh, a lot of the work that we utilize um, a lot of the work that we actually do in the office has been with chronic and post-surgical patients. So they tend to be very similar when it comes to pattern reintroduction. Now, some of the principles for progression, is, and we'll talk a little bit more about them, it's gravity management. Uh, by talking to gravity management is, you know, make sure that your patient is able to move with their own body weight, not necessarily all of a sudden start loading them after they just had poor surgery or surgery of their knee, right? Uh, sometimes it's it'll happen. Sometimes you'll be able to load the patient a little bit faster than, than others, but for the most part, start them with gravity. Make sure that they're strong in that scenario. Do they have competent range of motion? Are they able to perform full passive, resisted, and active range of motion? If they do, then we start them with short lever exercises. We start maximizing some of the references where they should move and we can even add some constraints where they shouldn't move. And then we can start maximizing some of that reactive training, which is where your neuromuscular system kind of comes into play, right? Jumps, uh, landing, uh, high intensity interval training. Now, a little bit of the programming rehabbing care, uh, it does follow that set principle, so special adaptations to impose demands. Uh, you are, your body is going to get better the more you do certain things, right? So if you are a trainer, you can start introducing some of these principles into your training within your macro cycle, your meso cycle, or your micro cycle, right? Uh, if you're a healthcare professional, you're most likely going to be working within the meso cycle and micro cycle with your patients. Uh, not a lot of individuals or not a lot of healthcare professionals end up building a 12 month macro cycle. Um, if, you, if you are, congratulations, that's awesome. Um, if you're not, maybe you want to work with a personal trainer or a strength coach that might help you build that macro cycle and still be able to introduce your micro or meso cycle of rehabilitation, right? Um, now, it is important for you guys to do your training lessons, uh, especially with your uh, strength coaches that you're going to be working with. You want to be on the same page that they are, right? Or actually, you want them to be on the same page that you are. That is just going to make communication a lot easier and it's going to help you refer them more individuals or more patients so they can get stronger and they can get better. It's a good uh, symbiotic relationship overall. Now some of the goals of programming your rehabilitation or your care. Um, now this is not specific to just post-surgical or chronic pain patients. This is just acute, chronic, and post-surgical. Uh, this could be just your programming, your care, or your rehabilitation. Um, building up the passive range of motion and active range of motion is going to be important. Reintroducing some of the movement patterns like we've already mentioned. Building that tissue resiliency, whether it's the tendon, the muscle, or the connective tissue. Um, and building that load capacity within those tissues, right? Uh, and then finally, just build your intensity. Now, building some of that passive range of motion, well, we want to improve some of the joint muscle motion to a point where you can move to fully loaded or unloaded range of motion. We want to make sure that this individual is able to perform low impact exercises that may even just be gravity, right? Or with full range of motion. 
Uh, part of that might be a dynamic warm-up style movement. So it doesn't have to be a full exercise uh, regime. It doesn't have to be a full powerlifting training session. They can just do some general dynamic movements that is going to give them a full range of motion, whether it may be low impact or zero gravity. And also they can start utilizing some assisted movements, right? They can use box squats to absorb some of the load on their knees. Uh, high box squats reduces the range of motion of the knee, and then they can start utilizing uh, a lower box in order to be able to get deeper into that squat. Eccentric lengthening, that's really good for hamstrings or bicipital tendonitis. I really like to do that uh, with those individuals and those patients that require it. And then banded exercises. Banded exercises are phenomenal when it comes to assisted movements. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen banded exercises, just pull-ups. Uh, heavy bands tend to be the best when you're trying to increase range of motion uh, and do uh, very little work uh, through some of these. Now, once we have that building, we have built the passive range of motion and we actually have them do some actual range of motion, now we start introducing them to movement patterns. Now, most of these individuals have already been introduced to movement patterns. So for them, this is gonna be a reintroduction. Uh, here, we look a little bit more into the constraints of the movement, where you don't want them to move, especially if they are going to, if they, if these movements are a part of what they do on a daily basis, such as power lifters, you don't want them to get too far out um, of the of their squat stance, or they may re-injure themselves depending on their injury, right? That lifters the same way. So we start looking at a little bit more like the movement quality, and then we start adding some quantity. So can they move well? Can they maintain the position for three to five um, squats? Perfect. Let's start. Let's try a little bit more. Let's do eight to ten squats, right? That's where we start reintroducing some of these movement patterns. Now, as you can see here, there are seven basic movement patterns. You got your squat, your lunge, your push, your pull, your bend, your twist, and your walking. Uh, walking is probably one of the easiest movements um, to reintroduce to your patients, especially if they've had some knee, ankle, or hip injury. I try to introduce my patients to walking backwards. So still facing, you know, if you're facing north, they're walking south while facing north. Uh, this tends to recruit a little bit more of their quadricep as well as their gait pattern when it comes to toe off and loading that heel. Following the reintroduction, we want to build tissue resiliency. This is going to be a little bit more, whether it's a tendon, muscle, or connective tissue. We want to accumulate volume through a variety of movements, whether they may be low volume movements or no load movements. Uh, we can do a lot of changes or we can utilize a lot of different principles from strength and conditioning, such as your tempo, isometrics, or even eccentrics to start building some of this tissue resiliency. Now, a lot of these movements are going to be based on what your patients or your clients need. So sometimes you may not need to do isometrics for a power lifter, but you may need to do some isometrics for a crossfitter. Uh, you may need to do some isometrics for a bodybuilder, but not necessarily for a weightlifter. So this is always going to come into play with who your population is and who your patient or what your patient is actually doing most of the time. Finally, we are looking into building load capacity and intensity. So when we're looking to build load capacity, we want to introduce moderate loads at a good amount of time, right? So gradually introduce these loads. Now, there's no specific timeline on what, um, how, much, how much of a jump you want to do with these loads, 5 to 10, 15 to 20 pounds. Uh, that is going to be dependent on how well your athlete is progressing through your training or through your rehabilitation and care. Uh, if they are progressing at a fast rate, you're probably going to be a little safe to gradually introduce a little bit more load. If you notice that they're struggling with certain loads, it's probably smart not to not to increase those loads until they are a little bit more comfortable with the load that they're working with. Again, you don't want to, there is no way, first of all, there is no way that you can create better healing effects with uh, overusing or overtraining some of these regions. That's why they got injured but you want to create some confidence and you want to build their confidence back so that they're not going to be uh, afraid of moving. Now, when it comes to building intensity, just like uh, building the load, 
we want to gradually reintroduce some of these high impact movements, whether it's jumping, landing, and even metabolic conditioning. So don't necessarily want to start with high intensity interval training, but maybe you start with some continuous uh, walking, right? No breaks, very low intensity. And then move on to some lower intensity interval training. And then finally, high intensity interval training. Again, this is going to be dependent on every uh, the difference between every individual. So sometimes you may be able to push a little bit faster. Sometimes you may be having to regress a little bit, right? So now that you guys have covered all of these um, principles, what happens next? Well, we kind of go back to the conservative man management pyramid and we do a little bit of retest. Now, we don't necessarily have to do our pain management testing again. Uh, we've done that. We've passed, we have surpassed that. We've done our load management. We've already known what our symptoms modifications are and we've done our progress and regression, right? So once we're in the progress and regression and you've finished your rehabilitation uh, programming, then you can go back to the load management. How have they handled the load management? Are they, are they good? Have they surpassed your care or do they need more? Uh, if they do need more, is there any progressions that you can continue to do? Or do you have somebody else that you may want to refer out, right? This is where having that strength and conditioning friend or that strength coach that uh, really just focuses on specific weightlifting or powerlifting, um, that relationship is going to help you nurture more patients because now they know that they can trust you to give them a patient when it's needed, right? If you are a trainer, it's always important to know where you can refer your athletes so that they get the best care possible. And that is exactly what we're here for, right? Here in St. Charles, we're here to provide the best care possible and meet all of our athletes where they need to be. Now, I wanna thank you all for spending your last hour with me. Um, I know that it is a beautiful Friday afternoon and most of you guys have probably stuff to do. So if you guys have any questions, please feel free to send us an email. If uh, you guys want to come in and shadow, if you're in the, in the St. Charles, Missouri area, please feel free to send us an email at Elite Spine Plus. If you're looking a little bit more into seminars and want to hone in your skills in barbell training or become a barbell training um, instructor, please let me know. Um, we'll be looking at that in, in the next couple of months. Other than that, thank you. Have a great afternoon. I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation and we will see you guys later.